dear viewers and listeners, welcome to the latest episode of Extra Extra. It's all about whiskey. I remain Jason Neil Patrick Harris Johnson Yellen, and he remains Joshua Morrissey Hatton. Hello, Joshua. Hello from beautiful, sunny, slightly chilly Connecticut. Very nice. Very nice. As you can see, I'm battling with light streaming in my window and warming me up in my thermal vest today. <laughs> It's making you look more pale than usual. Oh, interesting. Right mm. here. Also yeah, shaved. Yeah, yeah. That was a mistake. Oh, Shaving. that was bad. Yeah. yeah. Nobody should do that. No. Nope. If you're new to Extra Extra, we consider oftentimes a whiskey-related news story. We summarize it. We present it to the other. We present it to our viewers and our listeners. Uh, we riff. We have ideas. We think off the cuff. We have <laughs> incomplete you know, Joshua Hatton lists. Oh. We we run the gamut. But one thing that is always true is we get out of here in a tight 35 minutes. You can count on it. Count on it. Set your watches. However, today we're actually going to start with an email before we get to our story of the day. So hold on to that banner, Joshua. We're not going to oh. go banner just yet. Okay. You ready for this? Yep, I'm ready. We have in. an email from Eric Ramon. Yeah. Um, I think when he gets together with his siblings, they are the Ramones. But this is just singular. This is Eric Ramon. He loves being sedated. Loves it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, J and J exclamation point. Mm -hmm. I had meant to send this back when I first listened to season four, episode seventeen. Hmm shows how forgetful I am. This is in regards to your comments toward the end of the episode, where you all mentioned how you felt like your job was to introduce and turn people onto a distillery when you bottle something from said distillery. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say you gentlemen have at least one success story in me. I was able to have some of your Dalyuan nine-year-old bourbon cask at a local bar and absolutely fell in love. That also happened to be my first SCN bottle. Wow. Welcome, Eric. It's good to have you. Welcome, indeed. Well, anyways, after that, I quickly sought out and found a few more expressions of Dal Ewan and found that I think I just love that distillery's character, as I have loved all of them I've tried. It also inspired me to find many more of your own bottlings, which I have loved them too, as well as being introduced to another distillery I haven't had before, Inchgower. Anyway, nothing revolutionary or super interesting here. Just wanted to say a big thank you to you two and Jess for doing what you do and helping us whiskey fans explore and find new things to try and fall in love with. Thanks, Eric. What an absolutely lovely email. To receive isn't isn't that a remit right just introducing people to to new distilleries that's one of the things i love most about being an independent bottler well i i have to say eric has inspired me this day to pour a little inch gower and you have some inch gower too so you seem to have more you seem to have more um inches in your inch so gower I, than i do I opened this last night for a tasting I was doing. All right. <laughs> and so I, I had it I'm right just... beside me, ready to fire. Here, here's, oh, to, was... here's to Eric. And and I thought the Inchgower, as well as Eric's comment there, it was also timely. You just came back from Chicago where you were saying Mike Miller at Delilah's has been absolutely plowing through bottles of our Inchgower. He just opened his seventh bottle of of our <laughs> 10 year old inch gower people are are plowing through it i think he charges 15 bucks for an ounce so really good nice. price on it and yeah yeah people are digging I'm it really i'm really happy to hear that uh, while we're recording this i have a fly buzzing around that i'm actually trying to capture and uh, and it just escaped from my clutches, but it meant I put a white piece of paper in the sunlight, oh, and right. I got even paler for a second. So, is it a grundle fly? I, I don't know what that is. You haven't seen the movie The Fly, Jason? Oh my gosh! Oh, I have. Yes, I have. Many, many years ago, Jeff Goldblum mm -hmm. or the nineteen fifties original? Oh, I, I talked the Jeff Goldblum 
called okay. Dwarven wine. Yeah. yeah. All right. I got you. Well, here, here's to here's to Eric. Here's to Mike Millen. Everyone who's drinking it. Delilah's and Inchgower. Right. Well worth seeking out. Cheers. Indeed. Clang. Yeah. Cheers. And this one actually, uh, this one was a marriage of two casks for us, where we we married a refill bourbon barrel, and then another one that. Um, was from a first fill Oloroso hogshead. So we got 430 bottles for, from this one, which was a nice little it, lap. It came, it came quite far, didn't it? 54.5% mm-hmm. alcohol. Mm-hmm. It just, just absolutely cracking. Obviously went over very well at a tasting last night. So yeah, with Eric's email in mind, this idea right. of, of discovering distilleries, today's episode is uh, a Spirits Business article from Ted Simmons, Mm -hmm. uh, published November 1, 2023, with the title, U.S. Drinkers Still Crave Direct-to-Consumer Spirits. There we go. And as Eric was saying, he meant to write in after Season 4, Episode 17, and here we are, Season 4, Episode 22. So we didn't sit on his email, which we are guilty of doing, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, His email only recently came in. So thank Ah, you to Eric for that. Um, so just to just to give kind of the bare bones uh, here, I'm, I'm going to read some key sections of this. Okay. Uh, but it leads with 82% of regular craft spirits drinkers believe that U.S. law should be updated to allow for direct consumer, also known as DTC, shipping. Mm-hmm. So 82% of respondents to to this survey. What was the survey? Sovos Ship Compliant and the American Craft Spirits Association have published their 2023 Direct-to-Consumer Spirits Shipping Report, (laughs) which found that 87% of regular craft spirits drinkers want to be able to purchase products via direct-to-consumer DTC shipping. That 87% is up from 80% last year. Mm -hmm. Uh, So 2022 numbers. Of those who would likely... Uh, purchase spirits direct to consumer, 81% said they would do so once a month or more. And that is up okay. from 79% the previous year. Okay. We then get into a, a little quote, which is, yes, people are interested in doing this. Uh, distillers themselves are, are recognizing the value of this. Um. It goes on to say the report also indicated that 82% of regular craft spirit drinkers believe U.S. laws should be updated to allow for direct-to-consumer shipping, up from 79% in 2022. So up to 82% from 79%. And then the the quote that I really like uh, at the end here, and this comes from uh, Alex Corral, Regulatory General Counsel at Sovos Ship Compliant. And, And Alex... Coral says, it is notable how many DTC shipping bills have been introduced in large population states in recent years. The passage of a clear, direct interstate DTC spirits shipping bill in even one or two could mark a tipping point where, as it were, as Texas or California goes, so goes the rest of the country. Mm-hmm. Um, it then talks about you know what people would be looking to to spend on a monthly basis, how many would be willing to take a, a spirit subscription uh, from a distillery. Uh, but then Corral closes out by saying, it is only a matter of time before state laws catch up with the will of the people. <laughs> One thing you and I have been talking about, and we talked to Holly Sidewand about this, we talked to um, Anthony Levinson about this, uh, yeah. we talked a little tiny bit uh, to Bikram, uh, saying up in Norfolk. Um, yep. there, there's, there's this demand for DTC. Consumers clearly want it. Holly's concern is that if you allow producers to ship directly to consumers, there'll be no need for retailers. Mm. And mm-hmm. and I and I don't I don't think that's true. And I think Eric's email today does a lovely job of showing if thirty five hundred craft distilleries in America had the opportunity to ship direct to consumers, you would still need people to tell you who you should be drinking and who you should be looking out for. You would still want Agreed. some version of a curated selection. Is that a fair point? 
Yes, I think it, I think it's a fair point. However, I would argue that that Eric Ramon here had the luxury of being able to taste it from the bottle at a bar, which is which is something you don't often get to do at a retail shop. I shouldn't say you don't often get to. Not every retail shop can do it. There are retail shops that can, and they've got tasting stock, and then you can buy it right there, which is a nice advantage retailers have over bars, where you go to a bar, you taste it, and you've got to pick it up somewhere else. Which would suggest to me that that's another law that needs to be changed. You know, the fact that you can't go to all 50 states and have tasting stock at a retail store yeah. is ridiculous. So, I mean, there's so, there's so many ways to think about DTC. With regards to this article, it's talking about craft producers that want to be yep. able to ship to the end user. But then when we were talking with with Holly and Anthony and then separately Bikram, it the idea morphed in a, I wouldn't say it morphed, but we touched on the idea of retailers having the freedom to ship nationwide. Exactly. exactly. Right? We, freedom is is the guiding principle in all of this. Right. And and you know, when I when I think about a brand be it a craft producer or be it a larger American producer or be it, you know, a, a brand that's brought into the U.S. And I, and I, <laughs> when this comes out of my mouth, I have a feeling you're going to bring up a point where you said, but you said the opposite just two weeks ago. You know, there's something to be said for a distribution house with a sales team that that knows how to sell to a retailer slash bar slash restaurant who could then educate those retailers slash bar sure. slash restaurant yeah, sure. to help the brand out. Like I understand, wouldn't it, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we took a tier out, if we took two tiers out and then either A, the consumer can pay a bit less or combination B, the producer can earn a bit more wouldn't that be nice? Yes. Um, but I, I'm always concerned about that smaller brand that really needs the help of someone else to get the word out, whether it's a distributor, whether it's the bar owner. But, but I, I mean, feel like we're saying the same thing here, right? Okay. So, so I'm saying as an independent bottler, that is a role that we have taken on. So last night, mm -hmm. standing in Harrisonburg, Virginia, okay. I poured Virginia Distillery Company to a group of people who are literally one hour, one and a quarter hours from the distillery's front doors, and they've never had it, right? I also poured the Jack Rose Westland Selection, right? Mm. American Craft Distiller in Seattle, we're standing in Virginia. People didn't know of Westland, now they know of Westland. So, so there is somebody in that room sharing that. And so I, I think we're in agreement that even if you had direct consumer shipping, you would still want somebody sharing the good word, spreading the right. good word. Yeah, correct. Sure. Right. Yep. And so whether whether that's an independent bottler making a selection, whether that's a retail store with access to retail stock, mm -hmm. whether that's a distribution team being able to go in and actually present a brand, whether it's the craft producer themselves showing up in a store and doing one of these tastings. My my the general thrust of my argument here mm -hmm. is with so many distilleries in America, even with direct consumer shipping, you're not going to lose a, a middle person of some description. You can't. You're still yeah. going to want somebody telling a story. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I don't disagree with any of that, but let's let's take it back to this idea of DTC. So you've got thirty five hundred craft producers in the U.S. How are they getting the word out beyond their own regionality? Right? If you if you've got exactly, yeah. Springfield, Illinois distill Springfield Distilling, how are they reaching out to someone in Bridgewater, Virginia? Exactly. Like, yep. like, 
I, I guess what I'm saying is of those 3,500 craft producers, do you run into a situation where there will always be a segment of those producers that will remain a regional product? And is that okay? It's- it's actually a question I was going to ask you in today's episode. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I, I still go back to us talking to Jason at, at Black Button, right? When we interviewed yeah. him for One Nation Under Whiskey, mm-hmm. that was the very question we asked. You know, we've had this conversation about wineries for so long, and then we had it about craft brewing for so long, and now we've moved on to having this conversation with craft distilling. Mm-hmm. Is if you started a distillery today, would you be international? Would you be national? Would you be half of the nation? Would you have your border states covered? Would you only be in your own state? Would you only be in your own county? Mm. Right? Like, like, what would that look like if you opened today? And how could you grow beyond that? Obviously, you would need money to grow beyond that. You would need Mm. to be pounding the pavement. You would need to be in bars and retailers. The problem, as I see it, is as soon as you're out of market, somebody else is in market right behind you. And how do you sustain yeah. your message when you're not in a, a distant market regularly? That's a, that, <laughs> that's a tough one. You know, <laughs> is it, is it taste? Is it quality? Is it Presenting to people those who those who influence on the products that they're tasting, is it just knowing that, man, they really liked it and they're going to to preach about it? You know, it's mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. it's interesting. I'm I'm on. Uh, you'll be happy about this. I'm I'm hating Facebook more and more these days. Um, but uh, <laughs> I'm in a number of of bourbon groups. Um. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe those two comments are connected, but um, I'm in a number of bourbon groups. And as of late, I'm starting to see these bottlings that I'm simply not familiar with that people are talking about. People are sharing and they're saying, oof, this is worth the hype. Meanwhile, I I hadn't heard the hype, <laughs> but they're, <laughs> they're talking about the hype. So... <laughs> you know, so it becomes a question too of of where that information is being communicated. Is it in person? Mm-hmm. Is it on Reddit? Is it is it in a Facebook group? Yeah. Oh, that. Yeah, no, that, that was. That, I thought you were building to a bigger no. point here. <laughs> no, I. I <laughs> where where I, are I mean, people hearing things? Is the question. Uh, yeah, but, but yeah, so so I feel as if we're we're getting a bit far from this idea of of DTC. We are. And, and and so I did. I actually wanted to bring you back to to something that came up in conversation last night. And again, Holly and, and Anthony were mentioned last night, even at my tasting. And I was talking to a chap who's he was actually the host, he and his wife. Mm. And he's from Albany, New York. And he was just back in Albany, New York. And he and he was busy saying, you know, when I go back to Albany and and I said how far is Albany from Saratoga Springs uh, and he said oh actually my sister's in Saratoga Springs and I was just there and I said oh you want to look out for first fill spirits there Holly Sidewand is there yeah and and I was making the, a larger point to him of he comes back to Virginia we go back to the state controlled ABC stores the selection <laughs> goes in the toilet the availability goes in the <laughs> toilet it's it's uh-huh. miserable you know, hashtag first world problems right but it, it, it's not great if you're a whiskey enthusiast mm-hmm. and 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 so he was saying you know would they ship to me and, and I started talking to him about some of these laws that you and I have covered previously which yeah. is the these post-prohibition laws that were built on pre-prohibition laws mm. are they're, they're 100 years old they're older than 100 years you know mm-hmm. the end of prohibition is you know 90 years ago and and we're sitting here with e-commerce where who 100 years ago thought a private individual would be getting daily deliveries from across the nation and from around the world 
No, it's, it, it wasn't a thing. I mean, at that point, Nobody. there weren't even 50 states <laughs> at that point. They couldn't even consider the bigger picture. <laughs> and, and so I was saying to him, you know, and, and, and this is something you've grappled with on Extra Extra, is we need the federal government to make a decision here. We need the federal government to say, do do this with your shipping laws. Instead, the federal government says, let's make this a state's issue. And individual mm -hmm. states can make up their own laws for how they want to do it. But that, that only created the mess we're currently in today, which is you can go to Albany, New York, but you can't necessarily get your whiskey sent to you in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Like, that's a broken system. And I know you get very nervous about the federal government stepping in and making federal laws, but aren't we, uh, you know, based on today's article, aren't yeah. we looking at the rise of, of marijuana and cannabis sales where the federal government made it a state's issue? They said, we will not get involved, you know, go and, go and do what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. And now we're getting to a point where we're going to get a majority of the states having yes. marijuana and cannabis dispensers. We're already at a majority of the states, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that, that's a claim I don't want to make without numbers in front of we me. We were but... at least 27 a few months ago. By my count, that's a majority. Okay, I like I like your belief in the 27. And they've all got dispensaries in action? Like Virginia's got on the books. We don't have dispensaries in action. Well, I'll tell you, I was in Minnesota for the first time in my life last week, and they just made it legal um, just a few months back. You can go into a liquor store and buy gummies, like mm. high-octane, full-THC gummies at a liquor there store. Um, so, yeah. Right. So, so, so to my larger point is if the federal government kicks the can and puts it into the states and the court that we've got here, a number of states are allowing – Intra, intra state shipping, intra yeah. state shipping, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so it is allowed. I like this idea, though. If a Texas goes, if a California goes, it's almost like a domino, and then yeah. the rest of the dominoes come after that. So, so given as you're as you're hearing this from consumers, eighty seven percent of people want DTC from a, a craft distillery. Given your nervousness around states and, and federal, do you think it will be the states that topple the dominoes? Or would you perhaps like to see the federal government take a stand on, on something like this? Yeah, I, I feel as if I quite often talk out of both sides of my mouth when it comes to the idea of, of federal laws and state issue laws. You know, In this case, I would love to see a, a unified federal system that applies to all 50 states. I understand, however, that that can, that can affect brands, it can affect distributors. You know, if you have a, a retailer in California that just does an absolute fantastic job of, of shipping, of marketing that they can ship, of having the buying power to, to satisfy increased orders... Well, what does that do for a brand within other states who, how should I say this? You know, it's for us as single cast nation, we've, we have two ways in the U S in which people can get our bottlings, both of which, you know, follow the full three tiered system. One of them just looks differently, right? For our retail range, which is what this was, mm -hmm. um, we're distributed in 27 states. I wonder if it's the same 27 states as the, <laughs> the ones with cannabis. Coincidence? <laughs> Maybe not. Um, but, but then we also have our online sales where we employ, you know, a number of distributors to help us sh ship legally to the states, you know, that they are legally able to ship to. Um, if if we found out that there was a a retailer in Wyoming that could handle that could satisfy all of the sales for everything that we import how would that affect 
potentially affect the 26 other states that we sell to? Would would we as a brand want to say, well, maybe we just put all of our eggs in this basket and, and make it easy? And then what does that say for the people who don't want to buy online, who just want to buy local, right? So it's, there's, I, I, I just don't think there's a clean answer to it. I think there's ramifications to these answers to how you answer these questions, I should say. So uh, it, it strikes me in the example that you give, you're not going to get one liquor store that has all the brands, that has all the single cast, that has all the offerings, right? That's been one of the interesting things in talking to different people about Amazon, mm-hmm. right? Like what's the one store that services all states and gets things to your door really quickly? Amazon, right? The, the concern isn't that Amazon, if they enter liquor sales, will have all of the really cool esoteric stuff, right? They're, they're going to have a lot of your big box store offerings, and you go, yep, that's yep. great. A Holly yep. Sidewand is still going to have a curated independent bottling selection. So you may end up going to two or three stores to get all of your demands met. Mm-hmm. That's not really any different from how I'm currently shopping. I'm just looking for the ones that will safely, uh, legally ship to me in Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe yep. your options change. Maybe you know if, if everybody can ship to me in Virginia, then our local ABC stores have to do business differently, right? I I, I know there's it's very easy to look at this with a, a glass half full kind of mentality as a consumer, mm-hmm. right? As a consumer, all the things I want will be available to me right away. Oh, <laughs> life yeah, will be exactly. good, right? Yeah, yeah. It's not going to be that easy. We are also conflating the, d- the demand in this article for distiller, producer, direct consumer shipping. Two very and, different things, yes. And retail store brand shipping direct to consumer which i firmly believe both should be allowed both should absolutely be on the table i i agree and 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 i don't know if this was an article that we read previously and or part of the conversation that we had with with holly and and anthony which it was this idea that a producer whether it's a distillery or or a winery or, or what have you Mm-hmm. would perhaps have certain things that they would only sell directly from the distillery, from the winery, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. still mm-hmm. have other more core products or maybe even special editions that are that are not meant to be DT- DTC. That way they can satisfy both elements where they're they're you know they're selling through standard three tier, but also have the ability to you know, satisfy certain orders on certain products directly from their distillery or their or their winery. Yeah, I I don't want to wander too far away from our topic of the day, but I am curious based on that model that you're suggesting. Hmm. Somebody last night was talking to me about travel retail, and and saying, you know, I, yeah, on my way back into the country, I, I picked up a bottle at travel retail. And I'd never really thought about buying in country when I'm out of country and bringing it back in. And and we kind of got into this conversation about where is travel retail currently? It used to be a place where you could get a cheeky wee bargain, right? A liter of your favorite whiskey that that wasn't available in stores, right? That that, that size of bottle wasn't available Mm -hmm. in stores. Then it became a place for some some kind of special bottlings that were worth looking out for. And then it felt like it came to be a place that had special bottlings that were not worth looking out for. <laughs> and, and and you know, there was a lot of 40% and 43% being yeah. put. Yeah. I'm not gonna say yeah. dumped, uh, I'm thinking dumped, but put uh, okay. into uh, into travel. And now you sometimes hear like, oh, that's in travel and that's in travel. You might worth looking out there. Are you getting that sense? This idea that you're talking about right now about there is still some places to put special things. Yeah. Do you think travel retail is rebounding as a as a place to, to put special things? Well, you know, interestingly, I think another way to look at it is a place for for brands to put 
potential new things in, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, if, if memory serves, Seneg from Kilhoman was was a travel, you know, duty free exclusive, and then it became a core product. I, I could have that wrong, but mm-hmm. uh, but I don't mm-hmm. think that I'm wrong, mm-hmm. right? And so you can use travel retail to just gauge the success of this potential product. Hey, if it works, then let's release it elsewhere, mm-hmm. which makes me wonder, you know, Ardbeg smoke trails with this, you know. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm thinking of. Tanzania. <laughs> That's exactly um, it. <laughs> Is there anything in travel retail beyond Ardbeg smoke trails right now? Yeah, I, you know, in, in the end, I think travel retail, for the most part, is a place where people can get a bottle of liquid that's a bit more than what they're used to getting because travel retail tends to be a liter bottle rather than 700 ml or 750 ml. So you get a bit more liquid for a similar amount of, you know, similar amount of money. Uh, about I, this, this is a you know general statement. Uh, no, I'm I'm just I'm just rolling my eyes because some of the brands pulled back on the liter bottle in travel retail as well and just made it a seventy in travel retail as well, which is part of me. Travel retail got a lot less special. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure I have the best answer for this. I would say, however, that travel rebate tra- travel retail or duty free could have a heck of a rebound if they opened up to who they could sell to right now you have to travel internationally you can't travel domestically to gain access to any of the bottlings in duty free <laughs> imagine the amount of money the duty free shops could make if that could happen Imagine the exposure some of these brands would have if they would allow that to happen. The problem is it's because it's duty free. It's because you're you're meant to be going outside of the country and why pay <laughs> duties within the country. Right. So so I get that. <laughs> then if they could put those brands into retail stores, they could sell even more. <laughs> <laughs> I like your thinking, Josh. We should do away with duty. I am totally on board. You send out the the uh, petition, I will sign it. Let's get so, rid of duty. Okay, can you remind me how how we got here, though? Because I agree, this is a bit of a stretch from what you were saying to DTC. So you you were hanging your hat on the potential for distillers to have special releases that were maybe Uh, only at a distillery. uh, Or perhaps, as you and I are expanding this model anyway, perhaps Mm -hmm. retail stores, that's what I was thinking today when I was reading this article, perhaps retail stores would have offerings that were particular to them that could become available DTC across state lines as well. So as you were talking about special corners of lines, Mm. it got me thinking about travel retail, given that that is a place where traditionally brands have put special corners of lines uh, just to try things out or have an additional uh, option. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the difficult thing with this idea of TTC, DTC, especially within the US and and it rang true when we were speaking with Holly and Anthony it rang true with Bikram it's ringing true now is that it can take on a number of different forms depending upon how you want to look at it and i think that no matter what changes we see they they will and will have to be incremental nothing just moves we have sure. just just like it is with legalization of marijuana within the US this state does it and then just like with the example that the article showed of you yeah. know California right. and Texas do one thing will will states follow so uh, yeah so so maybe that is the case it's just going to be step by step by step <laughs> and it has to it has to grow in a way that not just the consumer is comfortable with but the consumer to the retailer, to the distributor, to the producer, and figuring so me, that out. So let me give you a, a quote that I that I um oh I had my my fly trapped and I just knocked over the paper that had it trapped and now it's on my screen looking at me, calling me all sorts of Glasgow names. Um, yeah. So so in the article it says presently eight states and Washington, D.C. allow for interstate DTC spirits shipping, Mm -hmm. while 47 states and D.C. 
allow for interstate DTC wine shipping. Mm-hmm. Talk about putting a target up on the board. Yeah, right. right? Yeah, like, yeah, It yeah. never used to be that number for wine, right? It's now that number for wine. Okay. How do we make it that number for spirits? Well, that, that's I, the target. I, I think the answer can be quite simple. You need the post office, you need UPS, and you need need FedEx or DHL, whomever. You need these shippers to be okay with it right now. And I think I think, and I could be wrong, and 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 viewers, listeners, or even you, Jason, please correct me if you feel I'm wrong or if you if you've read differently. But part of the reason why these shippers are hesitant to ship liquid is because of the high alcohol content on on some of these items, which I think is not necessarily like it seems like just an excuse to me because we do plenty of air freighting around with high octane liquid. Like it seems stupid. Is it back to just being able to more easily collect a tax? I don't know how it's done in wine, but it you know it, it would yeah, stand right. to reason that you should be able yeah. to follow a wine model and yeah. just translate it to spirits. Yeah, yeah. No, I I think that is that is primo. Let let's end the DTC conversation there. Um, I, I want to reiterate that going back to this Inchgower um, is remarkable. I'm just getting you know coffee notes, dark chocolate notes. Um, that Inchgower spirit is still in there. There's no doubt about that. Mm. It is such a wonderful drinker. Jason, I would argue that it, the spirit character isn't just still in there. It's being <laughs> framed so wonderfully by <laughs> by the oak, that sort of earthy, heavy spirit presence that, that Inchgower is known for is just mm. amplified with, you know, you, we had that refill bourbon ca- cask that just lets the spirit shine. And then that secondary sherry oak cask that just kind of says, here it is, everybody. Boom, up on a pedestal. Yeah, yeah, yeah really yeah, happy. That, that's story. an absolute, that's a winner. And, and I like the fact that it's not just you and me sitting here saying, you know that bottling we put out, it's a real cracker. It's, <laughs> it's Mike Miller, Delilah saying, I've just opened my seventh bottle that has been yeah. purchased by consumers who come into Delilah's. It's also the bottle that I, I that's the one I emptied at the Jack Rose Premier Drams as there well. That's when people came back. My friend says, you got, I got to try this. I've tried a lot of things. This is the best thing at the show. I've had this previously today. I'd like another pour and another pour. Like It's, it's a winner. So there you go. It's in retail. Go look for it. Uh, it's not on our website. See if you can find someone who will ship it to you. Uh, good <laughs> luck with that. But now this this was cracking. I, I love the fact, as much as we started with Eric's email saying, "Hey, thanks for drawing my attention to some, you know, a couple of distilleries here." I yeah. love the fact that we're on here saying DTC, DTC, DTC. Right? We want it. Our listeners want it. Our viewers mm-hmm. want it. Holly side one doesn't want it, but I, I think Holly will make out well from it uh, as well because she's good and she knows exactly what she's doing with her curated selections as there well. There you go. There you go. Um, if you want to be like Eric and drop us a note, you can send it to info at singlecastnation.com or questions at one nation under whiskey.com. No E in whiskey. Um, that's, that's it, Joshua. I thank Eric for, for emailing in. I thank you for your time. I thank Tim. Am I getting the name right? Dum, ba, da, bum, Ted dum, Simmons. Ted, Ted Simmons. You know, it really quickly, Only Ted, Ted, he's such a lovely guy. He worked hand in hand with our with our very own, one of our favorite people of all times, Susanna Skyver Barton at Whiskey Advocate before he was oh, yeah. with the spirits business. So he's there someone I go. got to see on, on the reg. As the kids oh, nice. say, and lovely guy. Yep. Awesome. Well, cheers. Cheers to Ted for giving us a DTC article uh, to talk about today. Uh, we'll get out of here. It is a very, very tight 35. Uh, and we'll get out of here the same way we always do. And uh, it's never been more pressing than in our current times I did uh, by gosh. saying peace. Peace. No balloons, Jason. 
It's oh, the it's because so, you're doing the UK. It thinks you're doing something else, Jason. There we so go. That, that was me just scratching my nose got the balloons. So. <laughs> Happens every time. All right, you got your now. balloons, Joshua. We're out of here. <laughs>